So here we're going to look at examples of entities that include subcorneal neutrophilic inflammation or subcorneal neutrophilic dermatitis or dermatosis. So the first entity we're going to look at here um, was called acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis or AGEP for short. And I, want, I wanted to present this against some other cases that, um, that were called pustular psoriasis or Snedden Wilkinson, just so you can get a feel for how similar these entities are and how you're gonna have to rely a lot on small little subtle clues histologically, but a huge part of it relies on the clinical information given. Um, and hopefully you'll get more clinical information and not have to rely 100% on just the histologic analysis, but we'll start off just by looking at this example of a pattern that we see. So there's some type of cleft or vesicle formation you can see from this power. As you go on higher power, you'll see intra uh, cleft neutrophils. And again, how are you going to recognize that they're neutrophils? You're going to see small poly-segmented nuclear contours. Um, usually you're not gonna have uh, an overwhelming amount of eosinophils compared to the neutrophils, but if you find eosinophils here within and among the neutrophils, not only in the um, cleft that's formed, but even in the, in the lower dermis, if you find a um, significant amount of eosinophils, and you have this pattern of um, subcorneal neutrophilic pustule formation, putting that all together, that would be consistent with an AGEP or acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis. Now, the clinical is typically that this patient took some type of medicine a couple of days, uh, 48 hours or so before the onset of small pustules, fine pustules that develop diffusely over the body, the face, the extremities, the abdomen, et cetera. And um, if you have that clinical history and you have this pattern of subcorneal neutrophilic inflammation and you find eosinophils, it's, it's all consistent with um, acute generalized ex exanthematous pustulosis or AGEP. In the epidermis, you can see a good amount of spongiosis that's not specific for this entity, but you can see that. And, you know, people would be pretty hard pressed to call this uh, psoriasiform hyperplasia. And that, that becomes important because that'll help you rule out uh, pustular psoriasis. And usually you will not find a significant amount of eosinophils in pustular psoriasis as well. And many times the example they'll give you for pustular psoriasis looks to be on a background of more psoriasiform hyperplasia and maybe even an acral surface like the palmar or plantar surfaces, which this is not. So this is most consistent with AGEP. Here's another more classic image you might find for AGEP. So you see subcorneal neutrophilic pustule. This is even smaller than the previous example. This example, the pustules had already formed into a larger bulla. Um, here, it's a small little pustule that's probably um, you know, a millimeter, to less than two millimeters wide. And within this infiltrate, you can find an ubiquitous amount of neutrophils and eosinophils, um, given this nice little circumscription subcorneal pustule. Um, the spongiosis and the perivascular inflammation with uh, abundant eosinophils. This is all very perfect for um, AGEP. So that's a good example of AGEP. And to contrast AGEP with pustular psoriasis, so here you again have a subcorneal pustule formation, but notice that thick orthokeratosis, so it's likely on an acral surface. You've got, it's not perfect psoriasiform hyperplasia, but it's closer to the psoriasiform hyperplasia we would expect compared to that last example. Um, sometimes, most of the time these are already treated so you don't get perfect classic psoriasiform hyperplasia. Um, it's kind of a blunting psoriasiform hyperplasia. You, you find areas of dilated vessels in the dermal papilla, um, some of which the lumen directly abut the basement membrane. That's all consistent with psoriasis, 
um, it's okay to see spongiosis in a background of psoriasis. And here you see this nice kind of loss of granular layer or hypergranulosis. Um, so putting it together uh, with the clinical, hopefully you would be given information. The patient does have a history of psoriasis, um, but this could be their first presentation. You may be getting a, a Von Zumbush type presentation clinically where the patient has systemic uh, manifestations, fevers, et cetera, changes in the calcium levels um, in the blood, as well as this picture of a subcorneal neutrophilic pustule on the hands and feet. Um, and oftentimes these actually rupture pretty easily when they're on other parts of the body and just show some fine scaling. And that's what you'll see clinically is just fine scaling because it gets so thin that it just ruptures. Um, so that's the classic clinical presentation and coupled with this histology, it's pretty good for a psoriatic um, or a pustular psoriasis. You shouldn't see a significant amount of eosinophils here in this entity. Um, so that'll help you. They, they wouldn't be giving you, um, Pustular psoriasis with a ton of eosinophils on an exam because that would be too tricky and confusing to separate from AGEP. Um, so this would be a really nice example of a pustular psoriasis. Now there's an entity that can look very similar to these two. This is called Sneddon-Wilkinson pustular dermatosis. And essentially you have that same pattern of inflammation with the subcorneal neutrophilic pustule. You also have diffuse... Um, spongiosis, you have maybe what looks to, to many people's eyes as some type of hyperplasia that could look psoriasiform to you. It's not perfect. Um, you do uh, notice a little bit of a retention of the granular layer here underneath that subcorneal pustule, which could be a, a little subtle hint, but it's, it's nothing to rely on. Um, what you're going to need is clinical information as well as a direct immunofluorescence to rule out things like IgA pemphigus, which can look very similar, particularly the intraepidermal neutrophilic types and the subcorneal um, type of IgA pemphigus. So Sneddon Wilkinson will be negative on DIF, and IgA pemphigus should be positive on DIF for IgA deposition within the epidermis. Um, so clinically, Sneddon Wilkinson is a difficult diagnosis to make. Um, because you have to rely on excluding other things. You, you would definitely want to exclude some type of bullus and petigo, make sure that there's no uh, bacterial infection causing a subcorneal cleft. You'd want to make sure you exclude the IgA pemphigus, as I mentioned, and you would still be considering an AGEP and a pustular psoriasis if you were just presented with this clinical uh, or with this histologic picture alone. So you would definitely need to exclude all of those other entities before you settle on a Sneddon-Wilkinson pustular um, dermatosis. So that's just a, an example for you of three major diagnoses um, histologically that can look very similar and how to help you differentiate among them.